Bobby accounts for 1 million jobs in the Gulf of Mexico region and $39 billion in annual tax receipts. Next, a House committee looks at how the Gulf oil spill is impacting the tourism industry. Witnesses include Kenneth Feinberg, administrator of the $20 billion Gulf oil spill compensation fund. Bobby Rush of Illinois chairs this subcommittee hearing on commerce and trade. It's about two hours, 25 minutes. We thank those who are gathered here for this hearing and the chair recognizes himself for uh, two minutes for an opening statement. And the chair wanted to admonish members that uh, <clears throat> anyone other than the full committee chair or the uh, full committee ranking member or the chairman emeritus will be encouraged to limit their opening remarks to two minutes because of the uh, time consideration for some of our uh, witnesses. April 20th was a tragic day for the people of the Gulf Coast uh, region of the United States. Eleven workers died following an explosion on the deep water horizon oil drilling rig located 40 miles offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. Since that tragic day, an estimated 50 to 150 million gallons of oil have leaked into the Gulf, severely damaging our environment, destroying people's way of life, and severely damaging the entire region's economy. Tur tourism is the Gulf region's second largest industry. It generates more than $39 billion in state revenue. Tourism represents 46% of the region's economy. Tourism employs over 1 million people. Various studies indicate that this oil spill has put 300,000 jobs at risk representing 15% of the total job base in the region. The saddest part of this story is that some of the businesses that are impacted today were still recovering from the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, which occurred over five years ago. Now that BP has created a $20 billion claims pool to compensate victims who have been impacted by the oil spill, the purpose of this hearing is to make sure that the travel and tourism industry will not be left behind, that they will be included. One might ask why. Well. I'm glad you asked. Because of the intricacy of that particular industry, the complexity of the methodology that needs to be employed to determine the level of damages and fair compensation, and because of, our, of, the, of the tourism's vast economic impact on the entire Gulf Coast region. Furthermore, we have learned from the massive media coverage of the oil spill and by various studies by the tourism industry itself that it is losing business not only because the beaches may not be safe, but also because travelers perceive that it is not safe to travel to the Gulf Coast region of the U.S., We've also heard the concerns of the industry about the claims process, its time frame for compensation and eligibility. Finally, we have to consider what needs to be done to bring back the industry to the stature it had before the oil spill. These are difficult issues we have to examine here today. The complexity of the matter may require more than one hearing. I want to thank all the witnesses for appearing before this subcommittee. 
We have concerns about the tourism industry and how it will be compensated and how it will be revitalized. And I hope our discussion today is a very fruitful and productive one. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Now I recognize the ranking member for two minutes. <coughs> two minutes or five minutes. Two minutes. Five minutes. That's fine. Whatever. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and uh, I want to welcome all the witnesses today. We appreciate Mr. Feinberg being with us, as well as representatives of the uh, tourism industry. Uh, we know that since the explosion of the Deepwater Horizon oil rig on April 20th, the Gulf Coast economy has faced many difficult challenges. We also know that this is the summer peak months for tourism, and uh, that many people have been adversely impacted by this uh, this uh, incident. It's my understanding that BP, prior to the Gulf Coast Claims Fund being set up, gave Florida $25 million to promote tourism, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama, $15 million each. To counter the publicity and the impact, the perception that uh, it would not be open for tourism. BP has been playing, paying claims to businesses affected by the spill. They've paid out, it's my understanding, over $200 million thus far in claims. It's not surprising that some businesses are having difficulty uh, getting their claims processed quickly uh, because really BP is not an insurance company. The administration of the claims process is being handled by Mr. Feinberg. He certainly has experience in this arena having dispersed funds as a result of the 9-11 incident. <clears throat> it's my understanding that he's going to be taking control of 36 BP offices and 1,500 employees established to pay claims to qualified businesses. Mr. Feinberg is charged with administering the entire $20 billion Gulf Coast claims account and paying legitimate claims to affected parties. Uh, it is an admirable and certainly a difficult position because we know that paying claims in this kind of a situation is certainly an inexact science. Will it be restricted to the beach resorts only or will downstream suppliers to the tourism industry qualify for compensation? There are a lot of unanswered questions. We do want to see that people are reimbursed who have legitimate claims. Uh, we know that there will be some people filing claims that are not uh, legitimate, but that is one of the challenges that Mr. Feinberg uh, uh, faces. And then one other question that uh, I think is going to have to be answered as we go along is the drilling moratorium in, imposed by the administration is certainly going to have an impact on the economy up and abo above the impact on the tourism as a result of the spill. And uh, there's going to have to be some questions asked about who should pay for the cost of, those, of that moratorium. Should it be the government? Should it be BP? So there are a lot of unanswered questions and I know that this committee is totally committed to making sure that everyone receives compensation that deserves it. Uh, we look forward to your expertise, your thoughts on this important subject, and uh, certainly look forward to all of your testimony. Thank you. The chair recognizes the, rank, the chairman of the full committee, uh, <coughs> Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the BP spill in the Gulf of Mexico is the worst environmental disaster this country has ever seen. And while we have every hope that the cap will hold and the flow of oil into the Gulf is truly stopped, we know that the devastation is enormous and its effects will continue for years. In the three months since the Deepwater Horizon explosion and blowout, the Committee on Energy and Commerce has held eight hearings examining the causes of the explosion, efforts to mitigate the damage, and the impacts on the environment and the local community. I'd like to thank Chairman Rush for holding our ninth hearing, which will focus on the impacts of the spill on tourism and the tourism economy in the Gulf area. The economies of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida are heavily dependent on the travelers who come to the Gulf Coast beaches each summer for swimming, fishing, and other activities. Across each of these four states, 
Some beaches are closed and significant fishing grounds are still off limits. Hotels, restaurants, charter boats and resorts are facing cancellations. Tourists are shying away from the areas of the Gulf even where no oil has come ashore. Diners and grocery shoppers across America are asking about whether the seafood is from the Gulf and whether it is safe to eat. Today we'll hear from tourism officials and business, businesses from each of the four states dealing with this catastrophe. We'll also hear from Kenneth Feinberg, the independent administrator in charge of handling all claims for damage and loss of the oil spill. He is responsible for determining the proper level of compensation for each business, worker, and family impacted by the spill. This hearing will give the committee a better understanding of the impacts of the spill on an essential part of the Gulf Coast economy and help us understand what we can do further to help the region recover. I thank all the witnesses for being here uh, today and I look forward to their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, for two minutes. For well, one minute, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't see the ranking member down there. I, I'm willing to let Mr. Stearns go. He's to my left. He's not normally on my left. Uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Barton, my friend from Texas, for five minutes. I thank the uh, distinguished gentleman from the... Uh, Windy City of Chicago, home of the Cubs and the White Sox. I appreciate that. I want to thank Chairman Rush and Chairman Waxman for convening this hearing today and appreciate uh, Ranking Member Whitfield and his uh, leadership on this issue. I want to thank each of you witnesses for appearing before us today. I know it's a busy time for all of you. Since the Deepwater Horizon exploded and sank three months ago, this committee in my opinion, has conducted a fair and rigorous investigation of the accident and developed what I consider to be a measured congressional response. Our Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, Energy and Environment Subcommittee, Health Subcommittee, and now the Commerce, Trade, and Consumer Protection Subcommittee are each doing their best to review and discuss all of the issues surrounding the oil spill. As a result of these investigations and the bipartisanship engendered by them, the full committee recently voted 48 to 0 to report out a blowout prevention bill that, again, in my opinion, is a balanced response to the tragedy. I want to welcome all of you witnesses today to consider our, our um, investigation, continue the investigation, especially want to welcome Mr. Ken Feinberg. Uh, Mr. Feinberg has competently administered the 911 Victims Compensation Fund. Uh, that was a very tough job, and I expect him to competently and transparently administer the current BP spill escrow account. The people of the Gulf Coast who have lost their jobs or had their livelihoods diminished by the oil spill should be compensated, should be compensated fairly, and should be compensated quickly. Uh, we're going to hear from some of the people who've been affected uh, uh, when we get to the other witnesses on this panel today. Tourism, fishing, and energy development are vital to the Gulf Coast, where they employ hundreds of thousands of people. The tourism industry, which is the focus of today's hearing by itself, generates over $30 billion a year. The oil spill reveals much about the Gulf Coast community. Many of us on this committee have come to know the strength of that community following the a vast swath of destruction that was left by Hurricane Katrina nearly five years ago. Gulf Coast people are nothing if not resilient, but with this latest man-made disaster, some of those folks must be wondering what on earth is going to hit them next. The Gulf Coast economy is tied to earth and ocean resources. The industries along the Gulf are so intertwined that the losses in one sector ripple throughout the entire regional economy. That's why if we're going to understand the magnitude of the tragedy, we must listen closely to those who are being directly affected by the administration's decisions, especially the one currently to ban uh, energy exploration. I've said this before, but the administration should reconsider its second moratorium decision. I think that's the wrong decision that they made. 
Enforcing a blanket policy in any ex exploration is not unlike sending a new oil spill or a big storm to further threaten the jobs of the Gulf Coast. The administration has some, shown some tendency towards panic in this regards lately. This should not be a time for panic, but instead a moment, a time for careful, thoughtful consideration. I hope the administration will choose not to forget about the fishermen, shrimpers, rig workers who share the same uncertainty as those who work on the beaches and the hotels and along the retail establishments of the main streets of the Gulf Coast. This is an important hearing. Again, I want to thank the witnesses. I look forward to your testimony. And again, Mr. Chairman and Chairman and Ranking Member Whitfield, thank you for arranging this hearing. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for one minute. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rosh and Chairman Waxman and Mr. Whitfield for uh, organizing this important hearing. You know, since April and the BP Deepwater Horizon blowout, uh, Floridians have been living their worst nightmare. The environmental damage, the economic damage is taking a terrible toll on our small business owners, our, our hotels, our fishermen. You know, we were just coming out of the recession. Uh, so BP's disaster is, is wreaking havoc again on our hardworking folks in Florida. And um, what is particularly frustrating uh, in the Tampa Bay area, where I represent, we've got the most beautiful beaches in the world, from Pinellas County, Manatee, Sarasota, all the way down to Sanibel Island. There's no oil there. The oil is hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And yet, uh, the word has gone out all across the globe, especially to Europe and South America, where we rely on all those tourists, that, uh, that the Florida beaches are damaged, that the Gulf Coast is toxic. We've got to turn that perception around. The efforts of BP to date have been inadequate, to say the least. Uh, what is... Uh, particularly maddening, is we watch these incessant ads, full-page ads by BP, that are polishing their corporate image at a time where they should be devoting a good portion of those monies to helping small business owners, our hotels, uh, get back on their feet and explain to folks around the globe that our beaches are pristine and we want you to come to Florida. Uh, rather than how many millions and millions and millions of dollars have they spent on polishing their own corporate image. Okay. So that's the frustration I wanted to share today. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from our expert witnesses. A, a special thank you to Keith Overton from the Trade Winds from St. Pete Beach, who is the head of Florida's uh, Restaurant and Lodging Aslo Association. We have a lot to learn from all of you, and I'm glad you're here. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, for one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and let me also uh, compliment you and Mr. Whitfield for your leadership on this hearing, and welcome, welcome Kenneth uh, Feinberg, uh, the Gulf Coast uh, Claims uh, Administrator here. He's going to have a tough job. Uh, I saw in the paper recently he said, uh, he said, I have a concern that BP is stalling claims. Uh, Yes, BP is stalling. I doubt they are stalling for money. It's not that. I just don't think they know the answer to the questions by the claimants. That's, that's going to be true. Whether you decide a claim because of geographical distance or whether you decide a claim because of ownership, uh, are you going to ask for tax returns? I mean, how are you possibly going to figure out uh, what particular claim is valid or not? So uh, we all pray and hope that uh, he'll have the wisdom, the wisdom of Solomon to do this. I noticed in a report as of July 24th, in Florida, 41,818 claims were made, and money that was handed out was $45,320,000. So obviously, some claims have been paid, and a lot of people across uh, many, many counties, and including counties that are not even uh, affected by the Gulf Coast, have been paid. Uh, Florida has the most densely populated coastline in the United States, and so this spill threatens our beaches. Uh, and as a former restaurant hotel owner, I deeply uh, sympathize and empathize with these businesses and hope, obviously, that uh, they're not uh, hurt badly and that we can come back. But in the end, uh, I think the uh, hard questions for the administrator, Mr. Feinberg, is how 
to solve the questions of who gets the money and gets served uh, uh, with the uh, extra uh, support. So, Mr. Chairman, I think this is a very important hearing uh, to hear from Mr. Feinberg and as well as the members of the tourist industry uh, what they think should be done. So, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Green of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Like my colleagues, I want to welcome our panel, particularly Mr. Feinberg. But on a personal, I'd like to welcome Mr. Brennan here. You reopened the Houston restaurant after a terrible fire, and, and we appreciate it in Houston. And Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for raising uh, the issues of the effects of the oil spill on tourism in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, having watched uh, Jimmy Buffett's concert a few weeks ago from Gulf Shores, uh, it's almost like we need that every week to get the word out in a, long, a number of different places on the Gulf Coast because that was a good turnout. People saw the clean beaches uh, and enjoying the music, so uh, we need to do more of that. Um, along the Alabama to Texas Gulf Coast, oil and gas exploration, fishing, and tourism are the largest industries for employment and in economic progress. So oil spill is a uh, profound impact on all three and during one of our worst economic times in the last 70 years. I represent a district in Houston where thousands have lost or furloughed their jobs as a result of the drilling moratorium. Other areas have been hard, hit even harder in some Gulf Coast towns, oil and gas, fishing and tourism are all they have, and now they don't have any of those three. I'm afraid this spill is going to have a lasting negative impact on communities beyond the environmental implications for years to come. With so much money being removed from the system, economies already hard hit will struggle uh, to bounce back. It will be important for us to help those communities. One way this can be accomplished is by fixing misconceptions that lead the potential tourists to believe that the entire Gulf Coast has been marred and cannot be visited again. I see it all the time on the news. There are white beaches and the water is clean, so hopefully people who are watching this will know they can spend their vacation along the Gulf Coast. I'm pleased that our expert panel is given time today to be here and I look forward to hearing. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, calling this hearing. I yield back my time. Mr. Lyle is recognized for one minute. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Whitfield. I believe this is a very important hearing today as we examine the devastating impacts that the Deepwater Horizon oil disaster has had on the Gulf Coast <clears throat> tourism. I recently toured the area around uh, Grand Isle, uh, Louisiana, and saw firsthand the devastation of the region and its economic impact on the people who work and live there. This area of the country is one that relies heavily on its fishing and tourism industries, and I am looking forward to hearing from today's witnesses and, the pers and their perspective on the disaster. I especially look forward to Mr. Feinberg's testimony and questions he may answer as the, to the administration's platform for the handling and distribution of the $20 billion escrow account to compensate victims of the oil spill. As disaster cleanup continues, we need to make sure funds are handled properly and in a timely manner and they get to the appropriate individuals that need that assistance. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Ms. Sutton is recognized for one minute. I thank the distinguished chairman for holding this hearing. Um, over the last few months, we've heard from BP and other companies involved in deep the Deepwater Horizon disaster and administration officials about how this tragedy occurred and how we can prevent it from happening again. Now, at one of those early hearings, I asked Lamar McKay, the president and chairman of BP America, if BP would consider the loss of profits for fishing and tourism as a legitimate claim, and Mr. McKay replied yes. And that was a good development after BP's reckless actions, uh, their culture of carelessness caused the devastation of our waters and coasts and wildlife and injured countless businessmen and, and the tourism industry. And the losses to these businesses, of course, have had ripple effects throughout our economy. Uh, and we've heard some of that detailed here today, where people from uh, places beyond the coast are feeling the effects of loss of tourism. Um, I'm interested in hearing uh, the testimony today from the witnesses about how the Gulf Coast Claims Facility has been processing the claims coming in and if this process can uh, be improved. Thank you, and I yield back. Dr. Gregory is recognized for one minute. Chairman Rush, thank you for calling today's hearing on the impact that the Deepwater Horizon explosions had on tourism 
in the Gulf region. As a member of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigation, I've had the opportunity to hear testimony on a range of matters relating to Deepwater Horizon, and I look forward to hearing from today's panel of witnesses. Due to the importance that tourism has for the economy in the Gulf, it's critically important that we use today's hearing to assess the devastating impact that the oil spill will have on approximately 46 percent of the region's economy. At a time when unemployment across the country is 9.5 percent, further impact to the tourism industry in the region will only exacerbate those economic woes. Mr. Chairman, this downturn will not only affect the areas directly hit by the oil spill, but it will also affect areas where the coastline and water are still pristine. Therefore, we must strike a balance within the funds being handled by the Gulf Coast Claims Facility uh, under Mr. Feinberg's uh, administration. Uh, in particular, based on his earlier testimony at the Small Business Committee, uh, I look forward to hearing from uh, Ms. Feinberg in particular on the challenges facing the Gulf Coast tourism in the aftermath of uh, Deepwater Horizon. And I thank all of you gentlemen who are actively involved in tourism industry. You know of what you speak. We look forward to hearing from you today. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Merrill of Georgia is recognized for one minute. Thank you. And the chair now recognizes uh, <clears throat> Mr. Scalise of the great state of Louisiana for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Whitfield for having this important hearing on the oil spill's effect on tourism in the Gulf Coast. Uh, I want to start by uh, welcoming a uh, dear friend uh, and a respected business leader from New Orleans, Ralph Brennan, uh, not only respected in Louisiana, but as former head of the National Restaurant Association and authority on uh, restaurants, tourism, and business. And I appreciate him coming and look forward to hearing his comments. And as my colleagues have pointed out, the tourism industry, including restaurants like Mr. Brennan's, is suffering from the effects of the oil spill, an industry that employs over a million people along the Gulf Coast and brings in approximately $39 billion in annual tax receipts, is now facing double-digit declines due to this disaster. A national survey done in May by the Louisiana Office of Tourism found that 26 percent of those who had plans to visit Louisiana had postponed or canceled their trip, while a June survey focused on nearby visitors along the Gulf Coast states found similar results. That is why it's so critical that the recovery fund being run by Mr. Feinberg is administered in a way that helps all of those that are being affected and will be affected by this disaster. And finally, Mr. Chairman, it's critical that the federal government does not add to the problems that we're facing along the Gulf Coast. And it's critical that the President end this irresponsible moratorium on offshore drilling. As people in Louisiana continue to fight the oil each day, President Obama and his administration are taking what is already a human and environmental tragedy and turning it into an economic tragedy by continuing to, sue, to pursue this reckless moratorium. Mr. Chairman, the economy of my state and others along the Gulf Coast are already suffering. The federal government's role is to help and not hurt our recovery. I look forward to hearing from our panelists. Thank you. And I yield back. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez of Texas is recognized for one minute. Chair, sure, thanks, the gentleman. Is there any other member? The gentleman seeing, does not see any other members seeking recognition. Now, uh, uh, the chair have a unanimous, unanimous consent request before the committee, Mr. Millison and Mr. Burgess, to sit on the panel uh, and ask questions. I don't see either of them here. Uh, if, in fact, they do uh, appear, then uh, hearing no objections, uh, if and when they do appear, they will be uh, allowed to uh, sit on the panel and ask questions of the witness. The chair also asks for unanimous consent to insert into the record a statement from the Northwest Florida Tourist Development Council. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Uh, now it is my pleasure uh, and my privilege to uh, recognize and introduce the witnesses that have appeared before us today. Uh, and uh, beginning on my left, uh, a name that is not unfamiliar with those who are here on, in this Congress, uh, Mr. Kenneth Feinberg, he is the administrator for the Gulf Coast Claims Facility. He's on my far left. Seated next to him is Mr. Roger Dow, who is the president and CEO of the U.S. Travel Association. Uh, seated next to Mr. Dow is Mr. Rip Daniels. He's the CEO and manager of WJZDFM, 
and he's also the vice president of the Mississippi Gulf Coast Tourism Commission. Uh, next to Mr. Daniels is Mr. Herb Malone. He's the president and CEO of the Alabama Gulf Coast Convention and Visitors Bureau. And seated next to Mr. Malone is Mr. Keith Overton. And Mr. Overton is the senior vice president uh, and chief operating officer of Trade Winds of the Trade Winds Resort. Uh, and he's also the chairman of the Florida Restaurant and Lodging Association. And uh, then we have Mr. Brennan, uh, Mr. Ralph O. Brennan, who is the president of the Ralph Brennan Restaurant Group, LLC. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for appearing in response to our request and our invitation. And it is the practice of this subcommittee to swear in witnesses, so I would ask if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please be seated. Please let the record reflect that the witnesses have uh, all uh, in their entirety answered in the affirmative. And now we will recognize Mr. Feinberg for five minutes for opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify. It's the fourth time I've testified in the last two weeks in the Congress, three times on the House side and once on the Senate side. And um, uh, I'm here again to answer any questions that the members may have. I am the independent administrator of this new Gulf Coast claims facility set up by agreement between the administration and BP. I do not work for the administration. I do not work for BP. I have been delegated the authority to design, implement, and administer this purely private facility funded by BP in a $20 billion escrow account. Um, I have been assured by both the administration and BP that this facility that I am administering will, in fact, be totally independent. I answer to the people in the Gulf, not to the administration, nor to BP. BP has, is setting aside $20 billion in an escrow fund to pay all eligible claims that are submitted to the facility. Hopefully, the $20 billion will be enough. If not, BP has agreed that it will honor any additional financial obligations that it may have over and above the $20 billion. Um, I am now in the process, as you know, of establishing this facility. It is not yet up and running. It will be up and running next month, in a few weeks, and will assume all responsibility from BP for processing private claims of individuals and businesses. I, I do not have any jurisdiction over government claims, state, local, or federal, none. I also have no jurisdiction over the moratorium claims for the rig workers. The $100 million set aside by BP for moratorium rig workers that is not part of the $20 billion and is being administered, as I understand it, separately. Um, I want to give BP some credit. It has already paid over $230 million worth of claims, not out of the $20 billion, but as part of its petty cash. It's paid out $230 billion in individual and some business claims. When I said, uh, uh, somebody, uh, Congressman Stearns, I think, reminded me about stalling. BP has not been paying certain problematic claims for the reasons really expressed by Congressman Stearns. I mean, what constitutes an eligible claim is a, is a major question here, and it's going to be a major question today when it comes to tourism. Um, it's easy to compensate a motel or a restaurant on the beach with his oil. You don't need the wisdom of Solomon for that claim. You really don't. 
You don't need the wisdom of Solomon for a claim involving a motel on the beach where the beach is pristine, but you can't fish. That's an easy claim. Proximity is going to be the problem here. Proximity. How far from the beach does a steakhouse that's lost 30% of its business because of a downswing in tourism? It's precisely the question posed by Congressman Stearns. What constitutes an eligible tourist claim? Now, I've got some great help on that from Mr. Malone from Alabama, who I've met with on a couple of occasions, who's thinking this problem through from the perspective of tourism in Alabama. Governor Chris in Florida has reminded me about the panhandle and the influence of this disaster on, a, on the Florida coast. But what I'm going to have to decide, you see, as part of this Gulf Coast Claims Facility is, what constitutes a direct claim, a direct claim that is immediately payable? And how far attenuated may a claim be from the spill? The overall impact of the spill undoubtedly impacts tourism throughout a particular state. I'm sure of that. The question is, what constitutes an eligible claim and what is required to be proven in advancing that calculation in order to get money from this facility. I'm as interested as the members are in hearing from the, uh, my fellow witnesses today. Maybe I'll come up with some additional ideas that Mr. Malone has already advanced for my consideration in terms of trying to come up with a fair, equitable, just way to determine eligibility and to determine what the appropriate compensation should be. I look forward to the testimony of my other fellow witnesses. I look forward to working with this committee. There are some members here who I've already been working with over the past few weeks. Um, and um, I look forward to continuing to work with Congresswoman Castor and others, who, um, congressmen from Louisiana also. Uh, I've been meeting with them. I return to Florida tomorrow. I'll be in Mississippi and Alabama on Friday, and we'll be returning to Florida again and Louisiana uh, in the next two weeks. So uh, you can't do this from Washington. You have to spend a lot of time down there hearing what people have to say, the uncertainty, the concern, and I really look forward to working with this committee uh, in the months and weeks ahead. Thank you. Mr. Dow, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Ranking Mayor, Member Whitfield and the members of the uh, committee that are present. Uh, it's an honor to be here today, and I'll, I've already submitted and will submit my testimony for the record, uh, but I'd like to be brief. Uh, to give you an idea, the U.S. Travel Association I represent is basically uh, represents the whole $704 billion travel industry where one in nine Americans are employed. Our 2,000 members represent all the airlines, hotels, lodging companies, attractions, et cetera. And our mission is real simple, and that's to promote travel and increase travel to and within the United States that creates American jobs. During the current uh, environmental crisis, that mission couldn't be more important. Uh, in my testimony, I'm going to highlight several things. One, the significance of uh, the impact of travel and tourism, which you've already heard distinguished members of the panel, uh, and also you will hear from the panel and also from the committee state, uh, but also the potential long term of the, uh, of the oil spill, the damages, and what BP and the federal government can do. Uh, it's mentioned that four states are impacted uh, to the tune of $94 billion of their travel economy and a, mil a million employees in the travel economy. But you also have Texas, which perception has not been hit as hard, but perception is going to cause people not to go to parts of Texas, and that's even a bigger uh, place. Uh, when you look at tourism, it's uh, as a much larger proportion in the Gulf region than in many in any other region in the country. 15% uh, of private employees are in this industry in the Gulf region versus other areas. Uh, when you really look at uh, how many people, the question is, who's harmed? As Mr. Feinberg said, well, 
and how long, are, I think, are very important questions. We commissioned Oxford Economics, one of the most respected uh, economics terms in the globe, to take a look because we've got to deal with facts, as Mr. Feinberg so rightly says, not hearsay. And we commissioned them to look at 25 national disasters around the world, hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, oil spills, uh, pandemics, and take a look at what would happen and, and the facts of data and how long it took them to recover. Well, as you've already heard stated, uh, Katrina, five years later, New Orleans hadn't recovered from pre-Katrina numbers. Uh, Oxford Economics estimates that the damage is going to be probably $22.7 billion. That's just to the travel and tourism industry over three years. What I want to talk about today is that cost can be reduced significantly by up to a third or $7.6 billion. Uh, we have submitted the Oxford Economic Study, and we've also submitted a roadmap to recovery with concrete ideas how to mitigate the damages so we can lessen them for the taxpayers and lessen them for BP, uh, using travel to stimulate the economy and speed the recovery. And it's three parts. One is to inform the perception, and we all know how important perception is. Second, create an incentive for people to travel back to this area. Third, to make businesses and people whole. And this must be funded by BP to help reduce the long-term implications. A key lever that's available to BP and the federal government is the opportunity to create marketing to bring people back. We're asking that the, uh, be considered a $500 million fund, which would give a 15 to 1 return or $7.5 billion to bring people back. Mr. Feinberg has the challenge of assessing real damages, but the challenge is, as left untouched, these damages will mount and will grow. We have an opportunity to shrink them, and we need to address that. And so with no guidance for uh, recovery, uh, we don't know how to submit the claim, so that is going to be important. Uh, we believe that the Gulf Coast, Gulf Coast Claims Facility is the right and only area to take $500 million and properly allocate it to the people that can make a difference. There's been many requests by states, and they've received, as you've already said, $70 million. The unfortunate problem is, of that 70 million, very little actually got to marketing. We'd like to remove the politics. We'd like to remove special interests. We'd like to get a transparent process where we can mitigate and pull this down. The damage has already occurred. Everyone's talking about capping the damages and capping the well. Well, we also need to cap the damages long term, and we can do that. The 400,000 people that work in this industry know how to do things in this industry. They probably don't know how to file a claim. So we need to get them back more quickly. A $500 million marketing effort will do that. We've seen that over and over. We saw that with SARS in Canada. We've watched for 98 days on television the problems. We can turn this around. We can mitigate it. Nothing is more important than getting a fund to do this, to put it in place. And I believe that will help the communities, the families, and the taxpayers, and in the long term, reduce the liability for BP. Thank you very much. The, the chair recognizes now Mr. Daniels for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Rush, uh, Ranking Member Whitfield, and other subcommittee members. Uh, I'm representing myself today. Would you, would you turn the mic on and pull it close to you? Thank you. I apologize for that. <clears throat> uh, I'm representing myself as a private citizen and not the Harrison County Tourism Commission, primarily because I wanted to represent small business as well as, uh, as it applies to tourism. I've been in tourism since 1978, starting as a tavern owner, radio broadcaster, real estate broker, tourism commissioner, and the primary investor in the coast's newest African-American hotel, the Almanette. I've seen firsthand the adverse effects of a range of disasters from Hurricane Camille's uh, destruction on the seafood industry's processing in 1969 to the economic recession of the 80s, which resulted in the closing of the Hilton and the Sheraton hotels, the complete destruction of the coast, tourism destination uh, by Hurricane uh, Katrina. However, I've also, I've also been a part of the recovery and renewal of the coast after each calamity. And the resilience of the Gulf Coastians in the face of insurmountable destruction is a testament to their faith in God and in each other. On the eve of the five-year anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, the coast was poised to have a banner year for tourism. On April 20th, the deep water horizon sunk, and so did our hopes to finally reestablish the Mississippi Gulf Coast as a tourist destination as opposed to a hurricane-ravaged resort. 
The impact of the BP oil disaster on tourism has been and will be a disaster. The devastation is difficult to measure because both the actual damage and the perception of the damage cannot be readily measured. Was the Gulf Coast spared because there was a limited amount of oil to reach the shoreline, or was the shoreline spared because most of the oil is still at the bottom of the Gulf, or dispersed in plumes? Is the perception of clean beaches better than the perception of clean seafood? In, in the words of my grandson, is it safe to go in the water? And if not, is it safe to eat the fish? One can glean that the Mississippi Gulf Coast billion dollar tourism industry is indelibly tied to seafood. According to recent Harrison County surveys, the number one reason for visiting the Mississippi Gulf Coast was the food, the seafood. Ladies and gentlemen, the coastal view is still gorgeous. The beaches are clean, the sound and the bayous are open for fishing, but the seafood, is it safe? How does the coast remove the perception that it's not? Surprisingly, according to the Hotel Motel Association and the Casino Association, hotel stays over the last 90 days have been up, and casino revenues have been up. But of course, that is compared to last year when the tourism economy was at an all-time low. Yet, maybe the fact that the Harrison County Tourism Commission, under my guidance, investing $650 billion in advertising did help at least with drive-in markets. Hotel Motel Association stats have shown that many of the room nights are as a result of extended stay, BP employees, government agencies, media, petroleum cleanup related businesses, and the like. Although there is a perception at times that the Gulf Coast revenue is up, is it the result of tourism or is it a result of oil recovery? And if so, does that not suggest that the recovery is not over until tourism is back to the ratio that existed prior to the explosion? The most serious adverse effect over the, last, over the lack of tourism, not recovery workers, is that many of the mom and pop shops, the restaurants, off boat seafood merchants, water sports vendors, and golf courses and the like, uh, have suffered. They are not getting tourist dollars, which were far greater. And then even more importantly, we have noticed that inquiries about future visits to the coast as it applies to tourism is off 40 to 50 percent. What happens when all the recovery money is gone and all the workers are gone? Ironically, just as the Deepwater Horizon was an exploratory mission, Mississippi Gulf Coast now finds itself challenged with the exploration of what to do in the coming years to fight the perception. There's too many unknowns right now. Considering the fact that we just had a, a bunny, one has to wonder just what will happen when there is another Katrina or another hurricane and just how many tar balls would be washed up. Ladies and gentlemen, on the Mississippi Gulf Coast as it applies to tourism, we are not enthusiastic about trading a billion dollar seafood industry for a million dollar whale. So we would hope and in, in my testimony, you will see some recommendations and hopefully uh, uh, some cures for this ill. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Malone for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, and thank the members of the subcommittee <clears throat> for inviting us here today. Uh, it's a tremendous honor to represent our area. Uh, it's an honor to represent the some 2,000. The mic to you. Thank you. Okay. It's an honor to represent some 2,000 business owners and some 40,000 employees that they employ whose livelihoods all are at risk as we sit here today. Our area began receiving oil on our beach in mid-May. We've continued to receive it, have some sheen offshore coming ashore today as we speak. Uh, this is our high season. With the oil impacts we've had, it is, I cannot describe it verbally as well as should, it should be. Many of us have had problems with the media and the way the media has overstated things, which sometimes they tend to do. But I'll tell you honestly, when the media in the second week of June reported that the beaches of Alabama were slathered with oil, we were slathered with oil. It was not a false report. Um, they failed to report how much has been cleaned up. Our beaches do look good today, and there's a cleanup process. It took a while to get it working, but it is working. What has this done to our tourism economy? It's distorted. We're devastated. We should be at 90, 85 to 90 percent occupancy today in mid-July, late July. We're running less than 30 percent. 
And when occupancy goes down, rates go down even greater. So our, our revenue to our lodging, to our restaurants, to everyone in town, I don't know of a single business, and I conveyed this to Mr. Feinberg in a recent meeting, I don't know of a single business in our town that has not been directly affected by this oil. It has created a sense of despair that I've never seen. Like Mr. Daniels, I've grown up on the Gulf Coast. I've been through hurricanes. We've been through hurricanes. I've been in this position for 22 years. I look at the eyes of my friends and colleagues around the community, and I see despair I've never seen before. Uh, we've mentioned and remember the 11 victims of the explosion of the rig. We've had a 12th victim. We've had a charter boat captain, Captain Alan Cruz, who in, in, the, in the sense of despair, beyond hope, took his own life. We hope that's the last one. We have measures in place to try to prevent that from happening again. We hope we're successful with those. We're the smallest beach, laterally, we're the smallest beach on the Gulf Coast. We had the least amount of coastline of any of the five states. But we generate $2.3 billion annually from our tourism product. With the decline that we see this in this high season, we fully expect our loss to be at or near a billion dollars just this year, not counting what happens in the summer, I mean in the future years. And that is the direct spending by the consumer, not counting the, the ripple effect as it would have rippled through our economy. So it is, it is devastating to us. It is about survival. Um, the BP claims process has been mentioned in the numbers that they seem to tout quite often um, of what they have paid. The bigger number is what they have not paid. Uh, last night I received an email from one of our local CPA firms that I know has been very actively engaged in the claims process. They have filed over, gave me a detailed list of over 70 claims they have filed on behalf of businesses. These 70 claims total over $27 million. This is just for May and June. July claims are just now starting to be filed. Of that $27 million, less than $5 million has been paid yet to owners. Of that $5 million, Three and a half million went to two claims. So as you see, there's a tremendous void in what's been filed and what's been requested and what's been documented. And this CPA firm is highly rep reputable. They've been actively engaged from the very beginning. And they, like the rest of us, are very frustrated why money is not coming into the hands of our business community. Without that, they can't support the jobs. They can't make payroll next week. They can't pay the notes that are due. That are due. Our industry is much like farmers. We prepare in the spring. We market, we spruce up the place, we paint the boat, we remodel during the winter, we're ready for the coming season. And just like a farmer who's lost his crop, we've lost our yield. So it is, it, not only is it a terrible time in regard to the recession in the, in the previous hurricanes, it's a terrible time of year for us. So I request to you today as this committee, a subcommittee and members of Congress is to do please whatever you can to get money in the hands of Mr. Feinberg and his his program and get it up and going as fast as possible. We have had two meetings with Mr. Feinberg. We found him to be very fair and open-minded. Our first meeting, he scared us with his eligibility requirements. Uh, but in our second meeting, he listened to our side of the case and he said, we've closed the gap tremendously with him. We still have some work to do, Mr. Feinberg, but we're, we're feeling better about it. And uh, we look forward to working with him. But our problem is I have businesses who have bank notes due last week. Every day that goes by is critical. Every week that goes by, there'll be another foreclosure. So when Mr. Feinberg says he's taking over mid next month, ideally for us, he would take over tomorrow. And if there is any way that members of this committee or any other members of Congress can help facilitate getting this in the control of Mr. Feinberg and out of the control of BP, it would be a tremendous benefit to us. With that, I would like to close other than to say that again thank you for your interest in this issue thank you to the gentleman who recognized our jimmy buffett concert thank you to the lady from florida who discussed beautiful beaches we share the same beautiful beaches with florida at least we did before the oil we look forward to the day those beaches are beautiful once again thank you mr overson you are recognized for five minutes <clears throat> thank you mr chairman and distinguished subcommittee members uh, for the record, we too are a little frightened of Mr. Feinberg so far, but I think we're going to get through it okay uh, as we have more discussion. Florida is the vacation capital of the country, uh, and it has been for generations. When visitors think of Florida, they envision warm sunshine, blue waters, sugary white sand beaches, fresh seafood, and a natural environment like no other. 
Uh, all of these wonderful characteristics have been damaged as a result of the perceptions that Florida's beaches are covered in oil. Uh, tourism is biz big business. It's our number one industry. We hosted over 80 million visitors in 2009. We captured nearly 17 vacations uh, from Floridians, 17 million vacations from Floridians. Collectively, our visitors spent over $60 billion on travel last year, generating nearly $4 billion in sales tax collections. What that means is more than one-fifth of Florida sales tax dollars are paid by visitors, and it also means jobs. Nearly a million Floridians are directly employed in travel and tourism. To give you an example of the economic impact uh, the BP oil spill is having on hotels, let me give you some statistics from my hotel, the Tradewinds. Um, for purposes of geographic reference, we are the largest resort on the west coast of Florida, just west of Tampa Bay, uh, located in Pinellas County. Call volume is down by as much as 25%. Uh, we have 800 of the county's approximate 35,000 hotel rooms. So when you take an average of the last three years, which is what BP is asking us for, of our revenue shortfalls, and you compare that to the revenue that we have achieved since the oil spill, we're down approximately a million seven. Now, if you extrapolate that out and you assume the balance of Pinellas County's 35,000 rooms have had a similar impact, that's a $70 million economic loss just in hotel room revenue and that doesn't include restaurants or secondary businesses uh, related to tourism. And then if you think about the Panhandle, which has 76,000 hotel rooms in its entirety, and the effects clearly have been more devastating to them than they have in Pinellas County, it's easy to see that the losses to Florida's tourism are in the billions. Uh, it's a substantial number, and it's something that we want to make uh, on the record today that we need help with that. Um, what's most concerning to me is that all of these losses have occurred to our resorts without a drop of oil being on any beach in Pinellas County. Uh, it's amazing to me how the perceptions of the media have gotten us to this point. Nonetheless, we're there. I also want to share with you that the Y Partnership conducted a survey uh, on June 18th, and it, it, was, it was asked at the time of the participants, which states will you, do you believe will most directly be impacted by oil? 95% of them put Florida at the top of the list. Florida is clearly the least affected state, uh, at least physically, from the oil that's impacted the shoreline. So clearly, again, I want to restate this as a perception problem. And I certainly think we can all agree that perceptions have worsened since June 18th. Um, prior to appearing on a Neil Cavuto show a couple weeks ago, I was viewing a monitor, uh, and it had the president uh, who was appearing in Pensacola Beach. And at the time, there were a few tar balls there, but it hadn't been materially uh, affected. And the ticker tape along the bottom, I couldn't hear what was being said, but it read, oil finally reaches Florida's beaches, plural. And when they transitioned to the next shot, uh, the television station, I can't recall which one it was, superimposed the oil running down the screen behind the president over the beautiful Gulf waters that were behind him. And I said to myself, you know, 25 million, 50 million, 100 million, there's no amount of money that's going to combat that kind of imagery. Uh, and it's a challenge that we're faced with, and it's going to be there for many, many years to come, I believe. Uh, much like what happened in the uh, hurricanes of 2004. We're still suffering from that and cannot gain occupancies in August and September that we used to achieve. I, I have five requests of the committee in closing, if you would uh, acknowledge them, and I would ask you to at least address them in your comments and your questions. Uh, one is, the media must be held accountable to accurate and fair reporting of the facts regarding this oil spill. Um, they have a legal and an ethical responsibility to do so, yet many of them continue to put ratings ahead of accuracy. Uh, I urge you to charge some agency, maybe it's this governing body, I'm not sure, within the federal government to review news reports weekly and hold them accountable for the sensationalism and the inaccuracies that are there. We need somebody to support us in that regard or it will just continue on even with the next crisis beyond this one. Number two, uh, we're optimistic that the oil leak has been capped. However, there's still going to be years of cleanup and recovery efforts remaining. We all fear that the claims are going to cease uh, being paid prior to the end of the actual losses. I think that's an accepted uh, concept today. Additionally, uh, Mr. Feinberg's recent comments, uh, comments with regards to what is a compensable or legitimate based on whether or not oil is on its own.
also very concerning to all of our members and all the tourist-based businesses within Florida. And we implore Mr. Feinberg and any branch of the government that can influence the claim process to look very carefully at this and not allow it to be a black and white issue. We want to make sure each business owner has an opportunity to be heard for their legitimacy of their claims and not just ruled out because of geographics. Third, I'd like to make you aware that uh, the CVBs in all of the Gulf Coast counties rely on bed tax dollars, and those bed tax dollars are related to hotel room revenues. When they fall, uh, revenues fall, then the bed tax dollars fall. We need that marketing money. We need to be made whole. I know that's not Mr. Feinberg's responsibility, but those CVBs need to be made whole on the dollars that have been lost for their marketing purposes. The fishing and seafood industry and our wildlife are critical to tourism and Florida's economy. I'm not going to go into the details, but I've included in your packet uh, some recommendations from very uh, legitimate Ocean Conservancy, other agencies that will help you in some of your studies as it relates to our wildlife. And lastly, we have to continue to spend money on marketing efforts, both domestically and internationally. Um, we have not yet gotten more money past the $25 million originally that BP has given to us. $50 million was requested by our governor, and it's been turned down. We really need that money. It's very important. This is going to go on for a long period of time, as I said earlier, and those dollars are vital to our recovery. I thank you very much for allowing me to speak today and, and giving you our testimony. Mr. Brennan, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, oh, sorry about that. Thank you for this opportunity to testify uh, on behalf of the National Restaurant Association and the restaurant industry. As you said in, in my introduction, I'm uh, from the Ralph Brennan Restaurant Group, and I've been involved in the restaurant industry in New Orleans for almost 30 years. And my family's been in the restaurant business for more than 60 years. And as a group, we operate 12 restaurants, nine of those in New Orleans. And Gulf seafood is an important ingredient in all of our menus. Uh, I want to thank you for holding this hearing and for your continuous focus on the oil spill's impact on the economy of the Gulf region and the nation. And I appreciate the opportunity to tell the restaurant industry's part of the story. Ours is an industry that employs an estimated 2.3 million employees in the Gulf Coast region. Restaurants in the Gulf Coast area generate about $77 billion in annual sales. Since April 20th, when oil began flowing into the Gulf of Mexico, our coastline, our sea life, our culture, and our tourism economy are again in great jeopardy. Uh, after Hurricane Katrina roared ashore on August the 29th, 2005, Gulf Coast residents and businesses essentially knew what to do to return to normal, or as we call it today, the new normal. The water came into New Orleans, the water went out, and we began to rebuild and move on but this is not the case today. The key message that I want to share with you is one of long-term uncertainty, impacting both the ecosystem of the Gulf and the economy of the Gulf Coast area, and potentially devastating tourism in the Gulf states. Across the affected areas, restaurants report a range of experiences. Those located in seaside or in beach communities are decimated as tourism shrivels. Tourists are not coming because there is either oil on the beach or in the water, or people have the perception that there is oil there. And visitor perception is key to decisions about where to vacation. The overall numbers of tourists are down, restaurant guests and sales are decreasing, product costs are increasing, and jobs are in jeopardy as already thin margins precariously slip away. In New Orleans, one of the driving forces of our economy is culinary tourism, and Gulf seafood is at the heart of our culinary tourism. Like we saw after Hurricane Katrina, convention groups and leisure travelers are now calling to express concern about upcoming business and whether to book future business. Many are asking if oil is on the doorsteps in New Orleans, and New Orleans is miles inland. Today, almost five years after Hurricane Katrina, convention bookings have not returned to pre-Katrina levels because of the damage to the New Orleans brand, and the oil spill risks surrendering the ground that we've gained over the last few years, along with future increases. While the focus of my testimony is not primarily on the BP claims process, I have heard from some of our restaurant association executives along the Gulf that there's a willingness to set up a claims center and that would be solely focused on the restaurant and hotel industries, and I want to voice my strong support for that idea. Regarding my three New Orleans restaurants specifically, sales are down, counts are down, costs are up, and margins are down, and this is not a sustainable business model. And as the oil looms offshore with an impact that could last for many years to come. With regard to perceptions and misconceptions, I'd like to begin applauding our state and federal officials for the stringent safety testing of Gulf seafood that has allowed truthful reporting around the potential toxicity of the seafood. 
But we are fortunate that 100% of the reports to date have shown that Gulf seafoods to be safe to consume from areas that are approved. Ongoing testing is crucial for a safe and informed public. Uh, despite the testing concerns about safety and supply, one of the re recent national polls indicated that 54% of the respondents said they would only eat seafood that they know does not come from the Gulf. Our staff has received many calls and comments, all centering around safety and, and supply. And to combat concerns, we have aggressively trained our staff to knowledgeably share precise locations of where our seafood comes from. To demonstrate support for the fishermen and the safety of the product, my restaurants have added seafood offerings. As I told the New York Times, the way to help is to eat Gulf seafood. If high-profile individuals, including celebrities, celebrity chefs, and even members of Congress, could be seen eating a Gulf shrimp poor boy, it would go, go a long way to alleviating consumer fear. The Obama family's visit to Florida beaches next month is a welcome opportunity, again, for positive reinforcement. And I know the National Restaurant Association is looking to plan some of its meetings in the Gulf Coast region, and I would hope that trade associations and even government agencies would do the same. Despite a curb in the demand for Gulf seafood, prices across the board have increased. On average, in my restaurants, we're paying 18 to 30 percent more for the seafood that we serve. Finally, I'd like to, excuse me, I'd like to comment on the long-term impact of a misinformed public. Uh, in the years after Hurricane Katrina, potential visitors from the, around the country thought that the city of New Orleans was still underwater, that the drinking water was unsafe, and there were no hospitals or other city services. These misperceptions were largely created and reinforced by the media because of the regular replaying of images from days after the storm. Many in New Orleans feel that it was only after the New Orleans Saints and the city of New Orleans hosted two playoff games back in January and the Saints went on to win the Super Bowl that those misperceptions were finally ceased. Misperceptions are happening again now. Just about every day a story is reported live from New Orleans on the spill. The perception shaped by the media, even if unintentional, is that oil is on the doorsteps of New Orleans. That's sensationalistic and untrue. Yet if reporting from these locales continues, the public will continue to draw its own conclusions and perceive New Orleans and many of the cities and resorts across the Gulf as damaged destinations. Marketing dollars will be needed to counter these misperceptions. The long-term consequences and impact on tourism of a damaged brand are severe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to be here today. The Chair, thanks all the witnesses for their uh, fine testimony and uh, the chair recognizes himself now for five minutes of, uh, for the purposes of questioning the witnesses. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Feinberg, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, at this moment, BP is still processing claims, I understand, uh, filed by uh, businesses and workers in the Gulf Coast region. Uh, according to your testimony, BP has already paid $200 million in emergency payments. Uh, despite these numbers, uh, we've been told as a committee that there are many complaints about the claims process that BP is utilizing. Uh, Mr. Malone describes the process as erratic, somewhat convoluted, and at times dysfunctional. Uh, and also in your testimony, you stated how complicated it is to determine whether the oil spill is true or approximate call or the approximate cause for the damages that businesses are suffering, even when there is no evidence or oil in sight. Many of these businesses uh, are on life support as they wait a determination of their eligibility to submit a claim against the twenty million dollar escrow uh, fund that BP has established. Uh, and Ms. Mr. Feinberg, I, I just have to ask you because I, I, I'm, all, I'm drawn to uh, the infamous and fictional, fictional uh, uh, Gulf Coast fisherman for his gum, saying that life is a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get. Now, my question to you is, when will the people of the Gulf Coast, the business people, the workers, when, they will get, when will they get definite answers? Uh, Mr. Dow talked about a roadmap to recovery. When will they get something specific 
from you or someone else about who's eligible, uh, why they're eligible, when they're going to get paid, how much they're going to get paid. These are just some basic questions. The guesswork needs to end and end. Now, it needs to come to a switch and out, the guesswork. And so your process that you're going through, I understand you got to go through this process, or go through a process in terms of getting to a point of answering uh, some of these very, very valid and important questions. But when is the process going to be over? When are you going to be able to give some clarity and eliminate the guesswork? I'll answer that very obviously critically important question with three answers. First, I believe that the blueprint that I have established for emergency payments to be paid as quickly as possible should be finished and available this week. That's first. That's my goal. Secondly, I have no authority to fund the $20 billion escrow account. That is a, uh, an agreement between the administration and BP. My understanding is that they are working overtime to try and finalize the terms and conditions of that escrow account, which will make the $20 billion available. I can't give you a time except to say I think it's probably within a matter of weeks, but I don't know. I'm not privy to that escrow negotiation. Third, I suspect that I'll be able to accept transition from BP. BP will get out of the claims business completely, the private claims business, and I should be up and running with the Gulf Coast claims facility the middle of next month, the middle of next month, a couple of weeks, and then I will assume all authority to process emergency claims, emergency claims, in which the, the fishermen, the, the small business, um, the restaurant will not waive any rights they may have. They will simply decide if they're eligible, they'll decide whether they want to participate in the program, and will receive, if eligible, and if they document, document their loss, up to six months of emergency payments uh, to, to help get them over uh, this immediate emergency. Now, that, that, Mr. Chairman, if I may just add, I understand from all of these witnesses and from the members of this committee Time is of the essence. This is a huge undertaking. And I am working as fast as I can, as diligently as I can, full time, to get the Gulf Coast Claims Facility up and running, to get it funded, so that these emergency claims can be made as soon as possible. What, are you considering the workers also in terms of, uh, will they be the same guidelines apply to them also? The same. I think BP, frankly, has done a much better job of this $230 million they've paid out. I think they've done a much better job of paying out worker claims, shrimpmen, fishermen, oyster harvesters, uh, than they have paying out small business and large business claims. I think that's clear from the testimony I've heard today and, I, and from the CPA in Alabama, and I think that's absolutely true. That's one reason why. I'm, I've got to get up and running with this facility as soon as I can. Chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Uh, Whitfield, for five minutes. Well, thank you again for your testimony. And uh, Mr. Feinberg, I think all of us are delighted that you will truly be independent. You're not reporting to anyone. I think that's probably good for all of us to get a fair and equitable uh, help on this problem. I noticed that Mr. Daniels, Mr. Overton, and Mr. Brennan in their testimony <clears throat> placed a great deal of emphasis on damages caused by perception as opposed to damages caused by actual damage. And uh, I've heard many people also blame the media <clears throat> for um, assisting in this misperception of the American public. 
And I don't think any of us are surprised by that because the media is focused on being sensational and obtaining more viewers and more readers and frequently without any regard to the real impact it has on people. But my question to you would be, <clears throat> since you're going to be up and running within a month, hopefully, when you start processing claims, from your perspective, it won't make any difference if the damage is caused by perception or by actual uh, damages. Is that correct? That is correct. Under the, uh, under the law of the Federal Pollution Control Act, which is a very important aspect of this whole process, uh, actual physical damage to property is not required. So the issue for me, you're absolutely right on, Congressman, the issue for me is not whether perception that has a, 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 an impact on tourism is compensable. The question really is going to be how far removed is a claim um, to be eligible. It's one thing if the perception harms a motel on the beach, even if there's no damage. It's another thing if the perception harms a motel 70 miles inland. Right. And I've got to decide. I take no advanced position on this, but th that is where I think that's what Congressman Stearns was getting at a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, where you draw that line on eligibility. And that's going to be one of the obviously key points that you're going to have to decide on. It kind of reminds you of the old Paul's graph case in torts in law school. <laughs> You remember. That's right. But uh, uh, on the, uh, Mr. Dow, you talked about a $500 million fund uh, to assist. Uh, now, would this money, uh, is it your idea that this money for emergency marketing would also come from BP? Uh, I I, uh, yes, I definitely believe it should come from BP, and the question whether it can come from this fund or an additional amount, but as I stated, I hope clearly is that this can mitigate the damages phenomenally to the tune of 7 to $8 billion. Just as all the money was spent to cap that well, we ought to cap the damages yeah. now. No one would say, let the oil run forever and let's just pay the people afterwards yeah. for their damages. Yeah. They said, stop it and we have to do the same thing. So I believe it should come from BP. Mr. Feinberg is maybe between a rock and a hard place yeah. of can that money come from the do, do you know. Do you have authority to pay out money for marketing? <laughs> I don't think, I'm, again, I'm not privy to that negotiation involving the escrow account, but I don't think under the terms of that escrow account, $500 million for marketing could come out of that $20 billion. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't other sources for it, but I don't think... I'm not an expert on this, but I don't think it could come out of the toilet. If I come in uh, for emergency payment from you and you give me emergency funds, will I be required to sign a release uh, for legal liability issues? No. Uh, will I ever be required to sign a legal release? You'll be required to sign a release down the road only if you come back to the facility and seek a final payment for all of your then damage and projected future damage. Okay. Only then would you have to sign a release, not as part of these emergency funds. Thank you. Ms. Caston is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dow, since uh, the April BP blowout in the Gulf, have you seen these uh, TV ads that BP has been running, polishing their corporate image? If you own a television set, you cannot not see them. Uh, I have seen them, and I've seen them, uh, and it just points out to me the very clarity that BP truly understands that changing perception and getting the word out is critical. I think the same thing has to be done for the citizens, for the businesses of the Gulf Coast. It is critical, and it can stem the damages phenomenally. I think you're right. I think you said it well. If you own a TV, you've seen these uh, incessant ads by, by BP. Uh, oftentimes not very informative, just uh, they remind me of political campaign ads, frankly. And, and, and you can't pick up a newspaper. Mr. Malone, 
I'm sure you're seeing in Alabama what we see in Florida. Is there a day you pick up the newspaper, you don't see these full page ads? Uh, that's true. And I can tell you that we have met with some of the BP officials that you see in those ads, particularly the gentleman that represents, he's in charge of claims for BP. We met as early as May the 11th in my office with our mayors and other leading people, some of our CPAs, in a proactive approach to try to establish an expedited claims process. Lots of promises were made that day on May the 11th. I don't mean, mean to be flippant, but in our community, BP has come to stand for a broken promise. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've seen one after another after another. In fact, they issued a press release around the middle of June where they said they had adopted an expedited claims process for business claims. Uh, I read you figures a while ago. It's not come true. Now, uh, Mr. Feinberg's right. The individual employee can walk into a claims office and walk out with a check for $2,500 or $5,000 if he's got his W-9s from last year or whatever, you know, minimum documentation. But when you ask a business to submit 2,200 pages of documentation before your claim would even be considered, that's onerous. And that same business submitted their claim in May, mid-May, has yet to receive less, more than 10% of mm -hmm. the claims they've presented since May to this date. Um, these claims, they refer to as large claims. They differ on whether that's over 20,000, over 50,000, depending on who you talk to. They are sent to a forensic accountant for examination before they're ever given consideration. That takes weeks and weeks to do. As, as I said in my written comments, it's, to me, it's the analogy of everyone submitting their income tax returns. And if you do a refund, you can't get your refund until a full audit is completed. They're doing a full audit before they're writing a single check to our businesses. It's, and, and I'm not always talking about the million dollar businesses. The guy who rents beach umbrellas on the beach, mm -hmm. submits $60,000 claims. That's his whole year. That's Don't his, you that, think it's, it's making folks mad because they understand how much this, this media campaign is, is costing BP. I mean, do you see the same thing in, Mr., in Mississippi, Mr. Daniels? You see all these ads and TV and uh, TV commercials? Yes, without a doubt we do. And actually, as a broadcaster, uh, we sell advertisement to BP. <laughs> that is, see, that's the paradox here. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, from a broadcasting standpoint, it's not necessarily the ads, it's the reassurance. Mm -hmm. And if the federal government would do one thing, that is reassure by way of Mr. Fein Feinberg's claims, but especially when it comes down to saying that the seafood is safe. What the rest of the world needs to hear, and especially the nation needs to hear, is that it's okay to go in the water and that it is safe and that it's being monitored. Right. I, I came up with the, um, we, I know someone had made an inquiry of BP about how much money they have spent on these ads and they refused to, to provide that information. So Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that this committee uh, seek from BP the amount of money that they have spent on their corporate image polishing campaign since the uh, BP blowout? Well, the, the chair will uh, consider the lady's request. I think we we'll direct staff to address a letter to BP specifically with that question in mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, and quickly, in my remaining time, Mr. Feinberg, this. Uh, We've got to be able to bring our, our local government and CVB uh, industry state claims as part of your $20 billion escrow. Uh, how do we do this? Do we need to lobby the administration and BP to have that included in this escrow agreement that is uh, going to be coming out in the next week or two? First of all, the government claims are included in the $20 billion escrow. They're just not part of my watch. Mm -hmm. Out of that 20 billion will come not only the claims that I pay, but all government claims will come out of that 20 billion. But the way the understanding was reached between the administration and BP, government claims are the direct responsibility of BP even though they're coming out of the 20 billion. But what's your opinion? Don't you agree that you and your experts will, uh, are competent, in fact, expert enough to sort through those very difficult and detailed claims? If 
it's the will of the parties to the agreement, uh, the administration and BP, I'm glad to, uh, so it's uh, take, up to them. take on that uh, as if I don't have enough problems, but I'd be glad to take on that assignment. Mm -hmm. But again, um, not on my watch at the current time, nor the moratorium claims either. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Mr. Martin for five Thank minutes. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, most of my questions are going to be towards Mr. Feinberg simply because uh, uh, he's got a huge uh, undertaking and we don't get him before our committee too often. But I want to tell you other gentlemen, I listened to your testimony in my office. I clearly understand the issues that you're dealing with and um, clearly support that uh, you should be compensated. I'm especially pleased to know that there's still a Brennan involved with Brennan's. That's uh, comforting to know since I'm a frequent visitor to your restaurants when I'm in, uh, in New Orleans. Um, my first question to you, Mr. Feinberg, oh, and let me say, I do support that there be a compensation fund. I do support that BP pays most, if not all, of the money that goes into that fund. And I do support that it be, uh, as I said, fairly quickly and transparently paid out to the people that have the claims. My first question to you, Mr. Feinberg, is who do you report to? Do you report to the President? Do you report to the Secretary of the Treasury, the uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve? Who exactly is your boss? Um, I don't have a boss on this assignment. I think uh, the, the fair answer, Congressman, would be that I report to the people in the Gulf, um, both the administration and BP, uh, frankly, don't want to get near me uh, once this program is up and running, and uh, they want to um, they so, want to reinforce no, the notion I'm totally independent. I, I, you did a, an excellent job in the other fund that you administered, but that was different. That fund was approved by the Congress. There were clear reporting standards. This is an, a, a unique fund. There, it really is. There apparently is no precedent for it. Doesn't mean, again, that we don't need it, but if my understanding is correct, now that you've been either asked to serve or appointed by the president, he does not have the power to remove you. Is that correct? I think that, I, I, I think that clearly is correct. Clearly okay. he doesn't have the power. All right. Uh, do you have to personally approve each claim to be paid? As a, as a theoretical matter, the answer is yes. Okay. Now, of course, there's going to be thousands of claims, and I'm going to have a process in place, an infrastructure, where problematic claims will come to me. Hopefully, we'll consistently apply the formulas, and uh, there won't be a necessity for me to look at each and every when claim. A, when a claim is paid, will your signature be on the check? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. All right. well, That's a good question. Where will the funds be deposited that you allocate? Will they deposit in the U.S. Treasury in Washington, in a branch office of the Federal Reserve, in a private financial institution or institutions? One, I don't know the answer to that question because I'm not privy to the escrow negotiations between the administration and BP. Two, I have urged uh, both uh, of the escrow uh, negotiators to deposit at least some of the money in local regional institutions in the Gulf that have expressed a real desire uh, to benefit uh, financially from this. Who, uh, from who this. makes the decision where what depository institution is to be used? Again, uh, that would be between uh, the administration and the fellow in the administration that I've been uh, consulting with is Tom Pirelli, the Associate Attorney General, and at BP, um, uh, but you have no definitive role in making that decision? None. You're purely make the decision what the protocol is for claims, uh, the claims process and the decision making protocol for, for making decisions on the claims and then being sure that uh, there's, there's adequate follow-up and documentation. Is that a fair statement? That is correct, and I want to make sure the checks don't bounce, but I, yeah, that, that is absolutely accurate. Okay. What reporting requirement, if any, does the fund that you're going to oversee have to report to the Congress on dispersion and operation of the fund? There will be expressed reporting requirements that uh, all interested parties, starting with the Congress, uh, will have information, whether it's 
monthly or biannually or, uh, frequent reporting as to how the, the claims are being processed, what the statistics show, our claim rate, et cetera. What, um, what transparency will there be for the public, i.e., will there be a public website that, that shows claims paid and who received the money and perhaps even pending claims in the decision uh, process by which a decision is made on a claim? Yes. Now, we've got to be careful, um, um, as we were with the 9-11 fund, that we don't disclose under the umbrella of transparency individual names or private information, proprietary business information, but I'm completely in agreement with you, Congressman, in your question, that we've got to have a transparent uh, database from which people can uh, review uh, how we're doing and uh, what our strengths and weaknesses have been. I have one more chairman, one more question, Mr. Chairman. I know that my time has expired. You, in answer to, to uh, the gentlelady from Florida's question, you indicated that other decision makers will have decision making authority over this $20 billion fund and that your authority is going to be restricted to to certain disbursements, do, do you make decisions on compensation for oil and gas workers who've lost their jobs? Yes. For Not the moratorium rig workers, though. I understand that. For, for fishermen yes. and, and process, you know, seafood, food All processes. individuals, all private businesses, no government claims. Okay, so you're, the, the government claims the decision maker is... BP. Be, well, they would, I wouldn't think we would allocate to them what government official would oversee their decision. No, I mean, I think the government official will send a claim for reimbursement, for cleanup, or for lost tax revenue or whatever to BP for processing. Uh, that's currently the plan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do we, will we have the, authority, the ability to ask quest, written questions for responses from the panel? Chair Newell uh, will uh, address that issue once the election. I know my time's expired, and I appreciate the chair's concern. I thank you for your answers, Mr. Fine. The chair now recognizes Ms. Schakowsky for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all the, uh, the, the witnesses. You know, I, I was um, listening to and looking through all the testimony here, and I think that it would be good for, for example, for Mr. Daniel's questions, he asked a number of questions um, to be included among those that we present as our own, uh, own questions. I think they're very important and that he deserves those, uh, those answers and so that we should um, include that in the, uh, in the questions. Yeah, those will be included in the written questions that we would submit to the witnesses. Um, thank you. Um, I also wa wanted to um, ask about the suggestion, um, I think it was Mr. Dow's suggestion, um, that um, the government incentivize a, uh, a, a camp, do, do an incentive for people to do tourism in the region. Was that you or Mr. Malone? Uh, it was me. It was okay. part of three points of uh, $500 million to get the perception, get the right information out, and incentivize people. Well, what it, well, exactly what does that mean? What is incentivize? There are several things that can be done. They've been done in the past. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> Commerce Department uh, runs trade missions. There could be incentives where they don't charge for those missions to get more people here. There's opportunities to uh, give meal tax deductions or some tax things have done. There's many things have been done in the past throughout areas that will give people an advantage uh, by going to an area and an incentive to do so. And we've got a list of them in that roadmap for recovery, ma'am. Thank you. Um, and I think, Mr. Feinberg, you, you may have answered this, but um, Mr. Malone said that he's personally spoken with a large number of business owners who have yet to see a single payment, particularly the, the, the larger ones. Are you suggesting that they refile when you're up and running or no? 
they won't have to refile at all. We will assume responsibility for those claims okay. and accelerate them as quickly as possible. As Mr. Malone has pointed out to me, and Governor Riley in Alabama has pointed out, we don't want to reinvent the wheel by requiring people to refile. Okay. Um, and uh, Mr. Over uh, Mr. Feinberg, Mr. Overton was talking about the, the damage that has been done even though there is no oil at all, is that, that's still true, at his, um, at, at his resort. Um, this is clearly on the water. Um, and, and so is his business eligible then for compensation from the, the fund? His business is eligible insofar as he has a claim where there's been no visible damage to the beach. He would have a that that's not the issue in that case. What I don't know from from that statement is how close is his business to the beach, how dependent is it on the beach or fishing or sightseeing or charter boats or what have you. So it is the facts surrounding the overall claim that are going to be critical in deciding eligibility in something like that. Yeah, this perception question is really hard to get your arms around, but may be the biggest source of damage long term. Am I, am I right, Mr. Brennan? Did you want to comment on that? Well, no, I, I think the best example is to look at Hurricane Katrina and the impact on New Orleans of the, the perception of the city as a damaged brand. And I think you as a member of Congress understand perception and uh, we have to overcome that. And just like BP is running these ads trying to change the perception of their company, we need to, to do a similar thing to change the perce perception of the hospitality and tourism industries along the Gulf Coast. Who, whose responsibility do you think, Mr. Feinberg, or is it everybody's, to uh, proactively address this issue? Well, I think it's BP's responsibility. I think BP's done some things, nothing to do with me. I don't, the, they, they, they clearly... Uh, haven't done enough. Uh, they've, they've spent some money, I believe. What I read in the newspapers, they've spent some money uh, promoting tourism in, in, these, in the Gulf, but uh, others know better than I about that. Uh, I'll address that. Uh, BP initially uh, spent $70 million, uh, $25 million for the state of Florida, $15 million for the three other states. Uh, requests have been denied by the governor of Florida and by uh, about 10 Gulf Coast communities, uh, not denied, they have not received any other information. The governor of Florida was denied, the other communities have not heard anything back. And the challenge is it's $70 million, and I, as I stated earlier, very little of that has actually, actually got to marketing. I think one of the most important things this committee, the BP could do is isolate the funds and say, let's get experts working on this and let's be sure they do the job. And I believe the gentleman to my right could do a terrific job overseeing that because He's proven himself. Thank you. Yes, I thank all of you for your for your efforts, Mr. Feinberg. You um, and and good luck on all your work. If I could, Mr. Chairman, just a point of personal privilege, I have spent um, vacations many summers on the Panhandle of Florida, and these sugar white sand beaches, which is of course the the lure, and the the notion that. The, both the beaches, that the beaches would be despoiled, but also that the reputation of this area would be hurt is just so painful. I can only imagine how it is to all of you. So I thank you for being here. Mr. Stearns is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Feinberg, uh, the question would be, uh, who's going to pay the salaries of the employees that you hire? to implement this program and disbursement of the $20 billion. BP. BP. Who? And how many employees do you think that you'll expect? Can you extrapolate from your 9-11 experience? Well, with 9-11, which was a relatively, thank goodness, a relatively modest claim right. um, cohort, right. we had uh, 475 employees. Um, BP, in paying out $230 million so far, has hired about 1,500 at 35 claims offices throughout the Gulf region, including, I think, seven in Florida. Yeah. Um, I'm now putting together a budget for the Gulf Coast Claims Facility. I think we probably won't need that many people, um, but I'll know more about that in the next week or two. I understand. So it's roughly going to be 1,500 or less in, in your Correct. 
and these employees will be paid by BP, I mean, by the BP funds. That's correct. And the, the salary structure, is this going to be something like the private sector or the government sector, or the again, private sector, the government <laughs> sector? Uh, again, uh, the deputy administrator of the fund, Camille Byros, who's putting, setting up the budget, she'd have a better handle on that, but okay. I can certainly get you that information. Uh, in 9-11, did you use, uh, what standard did you use for salaries? In salaries, we used uh, Price Waterhouse uh, had a uh, contract with the Department of Justice okay. that used largely private private I salaries. Got you. Okay. Um, I have here, uh, I think it's a four-page uh, claim form that BP used for uh, commercial fishermen. Um, I notice on their form it does not have a notary public on it, and it's just so people can fill it out. Um, do you intend to use the same form, or are you going to come up with your new form? New form. New form. Okay. And I noticed that with BP that 43% of the claims are still waiting payment. So that means are you going to take over and inherit all those 43%? And does that mean that these people who supposedly haven't got claim is lack of information, are you going to follow up on that? Yes. We will not require people to refile. Now, that 43% figure, I'm not sure that figure is accurate. Okay. Because BP apparently has counted as a claim somebody who makes an inquiry and gets a claim number and never fills out the form. So I'm not sure. I've got to get my handle on, I got to get a handle on that data. Okay. Let me just give you a statement and ask if you agree with this. Do you think everybody should get reimbursed no matter where they're located? if they can prove loss of income because of this bill? No. Okay. No, no. Because, you know, a family could say, I'm in Tennessee, they're going to go to Pensacola. They say, we're not going to go to Pensacola, we're going to go to Tampa. And then the gas station on the interstate could say, well, golly, I just didn't get that family Tennessee and make that claim. So, I mean, how are you going to work this so that it's, it's a fair thing? I have to listen to these experts that are at this table, like Mr. Malone. And Mr. Malone, in a very careful presentation, laid out for me sort of the pr proximity, the zone, where there's the greatest direct impact, and said, Mr. Feinberg, in that zone in Alabama, th that is the zone that is the most directly impacted. Tourism. <coughs> These are the restaurants, the motels, <coughs> the, the uh, other sites. And with input from experts, I will try and answer that very question as to what's the proximity where um, it's most likely that a claim should be deemed eligible. Mr. Feinberg, under 9-11, did you have anybody, um, accounting firm, come in and look at what you did? Was there anybody, not necessarily that you reported to, but somebody sort of like we have here, Inspector General or GAO can go into a government agency and sort of tell members of Congress what's happening. Did you have that under the 9-11 Commission? Constantly. The Office of Management and Budget. Okay. Now, you're not going to have that no. here. Don't you think you should, you would even want to have an Inspector General or a Claims Adjust or somebody that could oversee this and report back to Congress on what you're doing instead of you reporting back on what you're doing yourself? Don't you think, I mean, I would think I would like to have somebody checking up on me just to make sure that I get the uh, cross the, dot, the dots. I love that idea. I, I think we're going to do that. Now, we will have uh, a, a separate question related. What about, uh, I've heard this from various congressional committees, what about fraud? Right. What about the problem of fraud? Not so much auditing as just fraudulent claims. Right. The Department of Justice Criminal Fraud Division is working with us directly. You'll, you'll refer them to the Department Absolutely. Of we'll have an internal uh, retained uh, anti-fraud expert working within the facility to audit and check for fraud. But I absolutely have no problem with uh, transparency in the form of congressional oversight or some sort of regular reporting by an independent person checking on what we're doing. Mr. Chairman, I think what uh, Mr. Feinberg's mentioning is something that this committee or some committee in Congress should help him with this legislation that allows him to report to or they provide sort of a uh, inspector general type of accounting here. This is a huge amount of money, $20 billion, and uh, I, I think the American taxpayers obviously would like 
some kind of report. And obviously, we have great confidence in Mr. Feinberg, but I think at the same time, he wouldn't mind having uh, oh. somebody to counterbalance and show that everything is going, because this is going to be 1,500 employees that are working in, in, a, in a way that he can't control completely. So it's just a thought. Thank you, Mr. Feinberg. M Mr. Stern, your point is well taken, and it will be taken under consideration by this committee. Uh, now, uh, we recognize, uh, the, Mr. Green of Texas recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know you read a statement earlier, and uh, I'd like to ask this question, Mr. Weinberg. We know BP's paid about over $200 million in, uh, in emergency payments, and the committee has heard complaints about the BP's claims process. And Mr. Malone describes the process as erratic and somewhat convoluted and at times dysfunctional. I think that could probably apply to Congress in some cases. But uh, Mr. Feinberg, I was hoping if you could comment on how BP's processed at these claims so far, specifically what problems have you identified? I think BP deserves some credit here. Uh, most of these mass disasters that I've been involved in over the years when I get involved, I start sort of from scratch. There's nothing in place, and we have to build from the beginning. While I am uh, rushing to set up this facility in just a few weeks in August, BP continues to pay claims. Now, the problem is that, as, as uh, my fellow witnesses have pointed out accurately, BP is quick to pay the individual wage loss claims they're quick to pay claims where there is physical destruction, oil on the beach, or flowing somewhere, uh, uh, injuring property, destroying property, where they're reluctant or where they have less assuredness is business interruption claims, lost profits, lost business, calculating lost business, corroborating lost business, and that's why I think the gentlemen I'm, uh, that are here today testifying are frustrated by BP. Yeah, they've paid $230 million, but shouldn't they be doing more on the business side? And I appreciate that. And when I set up this facility, ASAP, we will focus on those business claims. Okay. And so you, your testimony earlier that the claims will be actually what BP is doing, you're, you're – you're monitoring those, and they're coming to you now instead of BP directly. They will be in the matter of weeks, and I'll accelerate the payment of those claims. Okay. And how do you plan the staff of Gulf Coast Claims Facility? We'll keep the people that are there now, we'll train them with the new facility. We'll keep those that we like. Okay. We will hire additional local, local vendors and local people in the four-state, five-state area as needed and we'll um, uh, set up this new infrastructure in a matter of weeks. We're doing it now, actually. Okay. Mr. Malone, can, do you have any response to that? Uh, I know uh, compared to, to Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama and uh, obviously the, upper, uh, the Gulf Coast, the Florida upper coast, um, have you seen uh, the, the payments getting better and more response? As Mr. Feinberg said, the small payments to the individuals have been fairly routine matters. The payments to businesses that are in excess of 50,000, 100,000 and up, excess of a million, have been extremely difficult to obtain. Um, is it because it, the it documentation is harder it's very, to show? It's very sporadic. They have been uh, some spells where they have written some companies some large checks rather quickly. Uh, other companies have been waiting nearly three months for their first check. Okay. Well, coming from where I am, and obviously we were concerned about Galveston a couple of weeks ago, but the, not that we don't have tar balls on a, on a regular basis, but, uh, but that wasn't the issue. And I know in southeast Texas, but my concern, too, is if each of you could comment not only on the BP's response, but also the impact of the moratorium, the hard six months moratorium we're seeing on uh, whether it be Alabama, Mississippi, or, or Louisiana. And uh, what are you seeing on that? And I, those folks, except for the workers, uh, they probably are uh, allowed compensation. If you're laid off of a rig, uh, could you comment on that? You talking to me, or Mr. Fowler? Yeah. Uh, I'm in tourism, sir. I'm not familiar with what's going on in the oil and gas industry. Uh, I know that our workers who are laid off get compensated. They go to state unemployment office, and what that doesn't pay them, they get money 
from BP. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm just not familiar with the oil and gas industry and what's going on with their workers. If, if a, wor a rig worker was laid off as a direct result of the moratorium, mm -hmm. BP agreed to set aside $100 million, not part of the $20 billion, a separate fund of $100 million just for moratorium rig worker claims. Has that been pretty w widely advertised, particularly in Louisiana, my colleague from uh, Melanson, uh, you know, that would do it? Because I have folks in my own district who work offshore. I have not heard, but the fear is that they're not going to be able to continue to work. Uh, I think it's been fairly well publicized, and BP is now deciding where to, um, where to dis um, deposit that $100 million, which will be earmarked only for unemployed moratorium rig workers. Okay, I know I'm out, out of time. Do you know how much of that 100 million has been expended? I don't think any of it yet. I don't think it's been deposited yet to pay out those claims. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your patience. Dr. Gingry uh, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, we have spent most of the morning uh, listening to our witnesses and, and asking questions and. Of course, it, most of the, the questions and the testimony is, ar is around the issue of how we're going to get paid. Uh, and of course, everybody looks at Mr. Feinberg, of course, he's got a tremendous job and responsibility in seeing that that's done in a fair and equitable way. Uh, and it's important, and, and, and you brought out the fact that, uh, that time is of the essence. I think Mr. Feinberg may have said that. The others of you have said, well, gosh, you know, uh, I think Mr. Overton talked about uh, Florida, and even though there are no, no uh, tar balls uh, washing up on the beaches, the, the effect on the economy because of perception. Uh, and we talk about individuals, rig workers, and, 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 and fishermen, and people that you know, have these direct claims. They're going to get processed real quickly. But the small business men and women across the country, the, uh, the, the, the husband and wife that owned the Motel 6, uh, you know, maybe 100 miles, 70 miles, I think was uh, mentioned, uh, from, from the, the coast uh, that are suffering because uh, uh, they depend on when all those motels along the coast are full in peak seasons, uh, thank goodness they call up their friends 70 miles away and say, have you got a vacancy? I mean, how many of us know when we traveled to Florida years ago with our parents that you'd just drive miles and miles and miles trying to find and all you saw were these blinking neon signs that said no vacancy? And you'd have to go 70 miles inland. So, uh, you know, th there's a huge problem and Mr. Feinberg, it probably extends a lot further than we realize today as far as uh, economic losses. I want to real quickly, you know, Rahm Emanuel, the, the, the chief of staff, the president, uh, was credited with, with making a statement, well, let no crisis go to waste. Now, from the political perspective, on our side of the aisle, we would, would say that was, that's deplorable. Uh, but from, from a policy statement, uh, if that's what he was talking about, uh, then in fact, I would, I would agree that we should not let a crisis go to waste and we should make an attempt uh, to make lemonade out of these lemons, uh, this huge lemon uh, of the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And you know what I think should be done? I'd love to, your opinion on it. Uh, the President of the State of the Union address said, you know, we're going to take $30 billion of the TARP money, the unspent TARP money. Uh, we gave, forced, in fact, the, the nine or ten largest financial institutions in the country to take that money even against their will. But it's been paid back, uh, not completely, but to a large extent. And the president said, let's take $30 billion of that money and let's give it to, uh, let's recapitalize the small banks uh, and, and help them make loans because small businessmen and women can't borrow the money that they need to stay afloat. Wouldn't this be a great opportunity for the federal government uh, to listen to the president and to actually follow through on this uh, and, and get money available to small community banks, not just in Florida, uh, all along the Gulf Coast. Uh, indeed, Georgia has 120 miles of coastline. Uh, in Florida and Georgia are two of the states that are seeing banks close every week on Friday, you know, you, or Saturday morning. You look to see, you know, which community bank is, is going under. And all these jobs are lost as a result of it. All these small mom and pops that invested five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000 to start that bank, to be part of the startup, uh, raise $15 million or whatever, they've, that money is totally wiped out. 
this would be a great opportunity to turn uh, uh, lemons into lemonade and to get that money in the hands of these small banks so that these businesses that are waiting on Mr. Feinberg to adjudicate their claims would have money to stay in business. I'd like, uh, I, Mr. Feinberg, we start with you, but I know this is not y'all's area of expertise, but you're all bright men and you know what I'm talking about. And I, we, we need to get this conversation going. Am I safe if I say worthy of consideration? Um, I, I how, about, how about damn worthy of consideration? <laughs> uh, Mr. Dow? Yes, uh, Mr. Gingrey, I, I think it's an admirable thought. When you talk about small businesses, you look at the Gulf Coast, it is probably almost all small businesses. New Orleans has big hotels and big hotels, but you look at this Gulf Coast, this is made up of people who have relationships with these small banks. People know they've got their records and all that versus the larger banks, and I think it's all small business. And the other thing, I also think this is a phenomenal opportunity. There will be another hurricane, there will be another tsunami, there will be another earthquake. And this is an opportunity for us to set in place how we deal with these disasters so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And that's why I think this marketing fund we've talked about is so critical, and we can, we can use this over and over again. But this is a great opportunity for the government to learn and to really set a process for the future. Well, it, it, and I see my time is running out, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to uh, uh, extend too long here, but, but uh, clearly, I mean, the president called for this to be done. It hasn't been done, this financial regulatory reform bill. Uh, the reason so many of us were opposed to it, it did nothing for Fannie and Freddie, but uh, as far as this uh, provision for some of that TARP money to the, to the smaller community banks, it, it never happened. Uh, so, but, but it's not too late, and we need to really look into this closely, Mr. Chairman. I hope we have an opportunity to discuss it further. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know some of the witnesses want to respond to this. It's up to you to whether or not. I'll, I'll shut up, and uh, you can let them talk if, if, they, if you give them time. Witnesses have a response? Yes. I must say I think it's a great idea. But I'd be remiss if I did not impress upon you that this is still a liquid situation. Every day, there are those of us on the Mississippi Gulf Coast who are praying that the cap stays. There is still oil in the water. And granted, the discussion of payment is excellent. Your idea is excellent. But BP doesn't have enough money when we talk about perception over the years if the oil continues to come. So I think the idea of utilizing uh, uh, the community banks is great. But what the people on the Gulf Coast needs is reassurance. What they need, and only the federal government can give this, by the way, is the reassurance that it is safe. The reason, no matter how much advertisement BP does or we do in the tourism industry, if you don't think it's safe to go to the beach, then you're not going to take your kids. So you, you, you esteemed gentlemen are the ones who are in charge of the DMR, OSHA, uh, the DEQ. You guys need to have, at, at BP's expense, an army of scientists, biologists, and marine biologists there assuring the rest of the world that it's okay. And first, assure them that there is no more oil in the water. <clears throat> so I, I, I think you have two components. I think <clears throat> Mr. Feinberg and BP with $20 billion will not be enough if we're still discussing this very fluid situation <clears throat> next year. Mr. Daniels, your, your answer is pretty succinct. We're going to move on. Uh, no, because we have other members who want to question the witnesses. Mr. Gonzalez is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My question will go to Mr. Feinberg, and I've had uh, the benefit of, of hearing your testimony in the Judiciary Committee, uh, but I wasn't able to ask a question. I want to ask it at this time. At the time of your testimony last week before Judiciary, that same morning, uh, Joe Scarborough, who's from Pensacola, was broadcasting his show from Pensacola and the beach, and he had a state senator. And the state senator make a, made a couple of comments, and so uh, I'll build my questions on the comments. Uh, the first one was, look at our beaches, they're beautiful, pristine, everything is fine, we're not getting people here. So it's the perception, and you've referred 
to this in the past, and, and I apologize, I wasn't here for all the testimony, uh, and that is, Charlie Gonzalez is thinking of going to Pensacola, but I'm afraid there's oil, so I don't go. No one's at the hotel or motels. That hotel motel owner is a victim of some perception. It may be false. Uh, how are you going to handle that claim? What was disturbing to me was that the state senator's comment was, uh, right now we've been dealing with BP on claims. Can you imagine now we're going to have to, can you imagine now we're going to have to deal with the federal government? And you've already made there is BP. But what would you say to that state senator? Why is it uh, that this Gulf Coast claims facility is superior to what was in place prior to the agreement? And I, I, the second question is the one that I'd like for you to answer, if you don't mind, and then go to the perception of the beaches being spoiled and such. I'd like to think that with the experience that I would bring and the confidence that the President and BP have in selecting me to do this, based on my prior work in processing mass disaster claims, BP is an oil company, not a claims facility, I'd like to think that we will be able much more efficiently, much more effectively uh, to process claims in a way that will uh, engender the support of the people that I'm trying to help. Uh, all the talk in the world won't replace payments and a sense that people have and businesses have that there are actually checks being paid to eligible claimants. So the proof will be in the, uh, in the result in the next month and I am hoping, with my fingers crossed, that um, the President's confidence in me and the Administration's confidence in me and BP's confidence in me will uh, result in the people in the Gulf having confidence in me so that the program is working and that it's credible. And to the second question, and, and I don't know, how, not to prejudge uh, any, any claims, but what do you do if the perception was that there was oil on the beach when there wasn't, but the businesses suffer? You do not need oil on the beach to have a compensable claim. I want to emphasize this. Florida law may require, I don't know, uh, Attorney General McCullum has a different view and probably the correct view, but you don't need oil on the beach. You don't have to um, uh, be unable to fish. Perception is compensable. Now the problem that Congressman Stearns and others pose well, what's the proximity requirement? What's the dependence on that beach or on fishing or on charter boats or sightseeing? I will have to draw some lines on eligibility. The lines will be based on proximity to the beach or to the natural resources, fishing or what have you. The industry, fishing, crabbing, oyster harvesting is easy. Motels, restaurants, depending on the motel and type of restaurant, legitimate, eligible. And how dependent is that claimant on natural resources? And I'll have to, in the next, actually in the next few weeks, I'm going to have to uh, develop eligibility criteria that will answer that question. Now the claimant still has to prove the claim. Eligibility is one issue corroborating the claim by showing that the spill caused my loss. That's another issue, but that's what I'll have to deal with. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the other witnesses, though I may not have a particular question. Thank you for your testimony, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The Chair recognizes Mr. Scalise of Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been talked about uh, by a number of you about the, the problems of perception, both with, uh, with tourism, with food, uh, the fact that, that even where some, uh, some areas have absolutely no oil, uh, you still got a double digit, if not over 50% drops in, in people that are coming. And, uh, and, and I want to start with you, Mr. Brennan. Uh, when, when we talk about how to, how to combat that, uh, especially once the oil, uh, you know, and, and 
we're all praying that uh, that this well is capped real soon. Uh, but there's still going to be oil that, that's, that's got to be cleaned up, and there's still going to be perception problems. Uh, I know our state's worked on uh, some different types of certification proposals uh, to, to encourage FDA to set up a formal process so that people can go out there and actually uh, have all across the country have a clear confidence level that if they're buying seafood, we know if you can buy it, it's safe uh, because our, our vendors aren't selling seafood that's unsafe, but there's a perception and a concern out there, and, and so a certification process would give a higher level of confidence. Uh, first, can you, can you talk about both that combined with marketing? What is it going to take, in your opinion, to get people to feel comfortable walking into a seafood restaurant, not just in New Orleans, but anywhere uh, in the country, uh, to know if it's from the Gulf that it's safe? Uh, Congressman, clearly there, there are two issues here. You know, one is the damaged brand of the entire Gulf Coast as a tourist destination, and the other, which you just mentioned, is the food safety concern. And uh, there are a number of regulatory agencies at the state and federal level that are now evaluating the safety of the seafood on a daily basis. And we need one consistent program uh, that can become sort of the gold standard that, so that people will feel comfortable. I had an opportunity to have dinner with a lady the other night from Santa Monica, California, and she said she would never eat Gulf seafood because despite what they, they're they saying about it, she still believes that it is tainted in some way. And there are probably many people around the country that feel that way, and there are restaurants around the country that are posting signs saying we don't serve Gulf seafood. So we, we have a serious issue here, and we need one standard so that the country will feel confident that the seafood that comes out of the Gulf is of the Thanks, quality. Thanks, Mr. Overton. Level. We'll just go. Go down the line. Um, the seafood industry in general, particularly when you talk about the fisheries of the Gulf of Mexico, have been underfunded for a long time, the research associated with it. And so, um, you know, back to the earlier comments of, of how do we bring something good out of this crisis, I think it is an opportunity for us to take some funds and do some measurable data on the, the water columns, the baselines, and know how many fish we have, how many have been, what, you know, this class of fish, is it totally destroyed or is it partially destroyed? It'll give us an opportunity to really look at um, what our data should tell us today. We don't have the funding currently to do that. And, and if I may, just one other point. When it comes to the perceptions, the, and Mr. Feinberg may have a comment on this, you know, the complexity that we're faced with now is that we actually lose money in September um, and in August. We, we don't make a profit. We, we make our money in the other parts of the year. So what are we going to do if we don't have a claim paid by then? And by the way, for the record, I'm not aware of any business owner in Florida that's been paid a large claim as of yet. So what are we going to do? Are we going to you know, become servants to the bank and our debt service coverage ratios, which are very important, those covenants can't be broken, or do we go lay employees off because we need to make that number? And that's what we're faced with. And it, I apologize, I've only got a minute and a half left, and, uh, and I've got a number of other questions. If, if Mr. Malone, if you can get me uh, a copy of the presentation that you made to Mr. Feinberg, sounds like y'all really put some things together that made an impression on him. If, if Would you be willing to share that yes, uh, with be, us as well? I'd love to, to see happy that, to. too. Can I, can I speak briefly to another question about perception? Real quick, if you can, because I've got some questions from Mr. Feinberg, and I've only got a minute now. Okay. The science community is doing a, our region a terrible injustice. We tend to believe the EPA, the regulatory bodies, but every week somebody, some scientist from some university, it varies, is continually questioning the quality of the water, quality of the air. As long as those questions are out there, these misperceptions are going to be all right, and, and I've got to get to my questions for Mr. Feinberg. Um, as you've heard some of these comments from, uh, from the panelists today, other conversations you had, uh, can, you, can you help give them some, some confidence that uh, when we talk about kind of some geographical limitations, uh, if you've got a restaurant in New Orleans and it's 60 miles away from, uh, from the point of impact, uh, how are you going to factor that in? I'm going to factor that in. Proximity makes it uh, uh, sort of a per se case. If you're right on the beach, or oh, you're right by the Gulf, by the waters, it's sort of, that's what I mean when I say proximity, it's sort of easy. Yeah. That doesn't mean if somebody has a, 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 another facility farther away, they're automatically ineligible. We'll take a look at the facts. Okay. Real quick, too, on the escrow negotiations, are you, are you kind of held back on what you can do to start setting up your operation and cutting checks for that to be completed, or, or can you start before they complete these escrow negotiations? No, I'm not held up. We're on parallel tracks. The sooner the escrow's set up, the better. But meanwhile, I'm going forward setting up the infrastructure. Can you cut any checks before the escrow no. negotiations occur? No, but I'm confident that by the, second, by the second week of August, uh, which is, you know, 
already too, li uh, too late. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the escrow should be up and running so that there'll be no uh, uh, inability to cut checks. Okay, and then you said with the $100 million, that's the only place to go for people who work on rigs. There's really no place to go that I've heard of for people at service rigs. Uh, can they go to your fund? Would you pay them out of your fund? And if not, is just unemployment their only option at this point? Uh, I, can, I don't know about unemployment. I can tell you that well, unemployed rig workers who are unemployed because of the government's moratorium don't have yeah. a claim against the BB. Because once this that, 100, fund. that 100 million is going to run out within two months if, if, if they start paying on it uh, by any estimate that we've been given. And so once that's extinguished, do they have any recourse other than just going on unemployment? I don't They're still uh, unemployed uh, and there's still a moratorium after two months. I, I'm just suggesting I doubt very much that they would have a claim within this fund. Okay, and then if you can give me uh, offline here um, the protocols for a review board. If as you're as you're setting up a process, if Mr. somebody Police, disagrees with your ruling yeah. and they rev and they want to go to some kind of Mr. judicial Mr. Police, process, yeah, what is yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, this is your last. Thanks, question. and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, the, the chair now recognizes Mr. Sarbanes of Maryland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the, the panel. Uh, Mr. Feinberg, I was going to ask you some questions. You say that you're not privy to the negotiations that are going on with respect to the escrow fund. Are you okay with that? Is that do you think that's better from your standpoint, worse? What's your perspective? I'm, I'm neutral. As long as the, 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 the money is available when the uh, Gulf Coast Claims Facility starts uh, uh, processing claims and cutting checks, that's fine with me. Does your, do your decisions, uh, are they immune from challenge under whatever understandings have been? No. 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 So if you, if you and Mr. Malone are talking about the appropriate zone and the government thinks you've drawn the zone too small and BP thinks you've drawn the zone too big, or someone who's on the outside of the zone doesn't agree with your judgment call, are you anticipating that there's going to be some challenge presented to that? Or, you, or under, the, under the structure of this arrangement, is that not challengeable? Neither the government nor BP can challenge my independence. But if an individual claimant business or an individual doesn't like my eligibility determination or doesn't like the amount of money that I've awarded, that individual has two choices. The individual can either, or not, not either, both. First, the individual can seek an appeal to three ex-judges or, or a, an appellate body that will review my decision. And only then can the claimant, who if he, he or she is still dissatisfied, Congressman, can opt out of this system altogether and go file a lawsuit. Got you. The, the, was it a condition of your accepting this assignment that the, the BP and the government agreed that your judgment calls would not be challenged by them? Yes. Okay. Mr. Malone talked about how there are people who, let's, let's, let's assume there's a good claim coming down the pipeline. And when it eventually gets to you, you're going to do the right thing. But it's not there yet. And the business that's seeking those, that compensation is in a position, as Mr. Malone described, where they may not be able to they may not be able to hang on as against the obligations they face from others, from third parties. Is there anything that can be done in your mind? Is there, is there, could you, even though you're not set up and ready to go, is there, is there some kind of comfort letter or something that you can provide to that business that says, you know, by all indications you will be in a position to submit your claim to us once we're up and running and you can use this letter and present it to third parties who may be leaning on you so they understand that you know there's some recourse available to them is that something that that's possible to do? yes first i'm going to be up and running in a matter of weeks now that's too many weeks but i understand that uh, that it that's small solace to somebody who's on, on the about to close their business. 
I'll be up in a matter of weeks. Secondly, if I know of that claim, I mean, BP is paying claims. If there's a claim like that, 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 that I can't wait two weeks or three weeks for your letter or your, your promise or your willingness to deal with me, uh, if I know of that claim, I'll go to BP for that claimant. I've, do, I've done this already. Okay. To try and, and ease that, that transition. So there is some recourse. I mean, if, if businesses can be identified that are kind of uh, caught in the switches here, there's a way you can get that in yes. front of BP and say, before it's too late, do something here while we're in this transition period. Okay. All right. Thank you. I yield back my time. The chair recognizes uh, Dr. Burgess for five minutes. Well, I thank the chairman for the consideration. I'm not part of the subcommittee, but I am part of the full committee. Um, Mr. Feinberg, if I understood correctly in your answer to a question Mr. Barton asked, that the framework that is being set up surrounding your administering this fund is actually being done in, in the White House by an assistant attorney general, is that correct? The, escrow, no, the, the framework setting up my claims facility is being done by me. The framework for setting up the $20 billion escrow fund, my understanding is, because I'm not privy to those negotiations, is between the Associate Attorney General's office and people at BP in Houston. Now, at some point, though, those two universes have to merge is that correct? Otherwise, you have a structure with no fund. You got it. And they've got a fund with That's no structure. Right. That's right. When that merging occurs, will we on the Energy and Commerce Committee be made aware of what that structure looks like and how the fund then subsequently is to be administered? Uh, I would think so. You'll certainly uh, be uh, entirely up to, uh, uh, up to date on what I'm doing with the claims facility and how that's working, what the protocol is, how we're drawing on the money. You'll have, there'll be full transparency as to what I'm doing. Where will, uh, well, let me just ask you this. When, when you worked, 9-11 was before my time, but when you worked administering that fund, who, for whom were you working? I was working for the Department of Justice and Attorney General John Ashcroft. So you received a paycheck from, from the Department of Justice? I, I did. I, I worked on that assignment entirely pro bono. Okay. Had you been paid, though, likely would have come from the Department, Department of, Justice. of Justice. On this, are you working pro bono on this account? No, I am not. The entire cost of this fund, the facility, Gulf Coast Claims Facility, must, of course, be paid by BP. You can't ask the claimants to fund any part of it, and you can't ask the government to fund any part of it. Well, then that, then that begs the question, who is, who is signing your paycheck? I am sure that BP is signing not only my paycheck, but is signing the paycheck of everybody working in this independent Gulf Coast claims facility. How, do you see any difficulty in maintaining the independence with, with them holding the, uh, the title of paymaster? I don't see any difficulty in maintaining my independence. I certainly do see the implication of your question, which is there could be a perception that since BP is paying, um, shouldn't we um, have more transparency or full disclosure? And I agree with that. And, and I think that's where we'd like to be of service to you and provide some help to you. When the 9-11 compensation fund was set up, my understanding, again, I was not here, but that was set up under a congressional authorization or congressional charter. Is that correct? It was a, it was a federal statute. Right, but it was a, as a direct result as a, as of action taken in the United States That's Congress. Right. But this is a little different. There, Very different. There has been no action taken in the United States Congress. So if we invite you, for example, to our Committee on Oversight and Investigations, if Chairman Rush invites you back to this committee, May we expect your attendance? You certainly may, uh, with honor. Well, uh, I will just say, as the ranking member on oversight and investigations, and who knows what will happen to the world after November, but as the current ranking member, uh, we will welcome you back, or welcome you to that committee sometime this fall when you actually get funded uh, if to to have a, a visit about how those funds are actually being dispersed. And of course, we also will be terribly interested in how the, the, the merging of, of the structure that you're producing and the funding that is yet to happen. You know, we had a field hearing 
the 1st of June down at Chalmette, Louisiana. Chalmette virtually destroyed in Katrina, built back, and now they're being destroyed by the oil spill and then subsequently the moratorium. And there was a, a hotel operator there who uh, talked about how he was keeping his cash flow going by borrowing and having run a business before. I know it's hard to keep your cash flow going if you're borrowing. And I asked him who was co-signing his loans with him, and he said his wife. I said, well, that's not exactly what I had in mind. I was kind of hoping BP was co-signing those notes with you, and he said, no such luck. Are we going to get to a point where that individual or an individual in similar circumstance uh, can continue to maintain their business without facing future financial ruin? That'll be my goal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy. I'll yield back. The chair recognizes Mr. Millicent for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the, uh, you allowing me to wave on. Uh, if I would, I'd like to submit a statement for the record since um, uh, I'm not a member of the subcommittee. Order. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd like to welcome my friend uh, Ralph Brennan with the Restaurant Association. Uh, we worked many years ago on a uh, promotion for Louisiana, not only out of Louisiana, but also internationally. And I guess my question to you is, do you remember how many years it took us to build that reputation once we got that fund up and running? Congressman, I don't remember the number of years, but it's a long time. And so we're right now kind of reverting back to where we were, and we're going to have to have some ability as well as Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and Texas uh, to get that message back out once this gulf has been cleaned up. Uh, so it's a long time coming. Yes, sir. Uh, so I guess, Mr. Feinberg, uh, is there any indication from BP uh, of how long they're going to be in this thing, or are they thinking that this $20 billion is the all to end all, and um, is it going to be the end then? BP has made it very clear publicly and privately that if the $20 billion isn't enough, and I certainly hope it is, but if it isn't enough, they have promised to honor any additional financial obligations that might be their, its responsibility. Um, Mr. Feinberg, if I could, um, can you tell me what the hell this Alabama lawsuit's about? I'm sorry? This Alabama lawsuit, what is that about? I mean, BP is a responsible party. They're obligated not only for the money, for, but for paying for the administration of it. So somebody's filing, Alabama, I think, is filing suit. Right. I'm not. Uh, that was something I I'd, I'd heard on the news the other day. I was wondering if what that was all about. Maybe I didn't get my full full information. Uh, Ralph, let me let me ask you as a person from Louisiana and um, for the Mississippi folks, I spent quite a number of days uh, along the coast, including the Mississippi Gulf Coast after Katrina. Um, we're all in this thing together. Um, I fully support every state that's been affected, whether it's from the storms or whether it's from BP. Uh, I wasn't here for the opening statement, and I apologize to all of you that for that. But Ralph, is there anything since the discussions have started? Uh, that has come to your mind that you wish you may have said or you might want to still say um, while I still have two minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, Congressman, all, all I would say is, and I said this in my opening remarks, this is a long-term problem. Uh, unlike Katrina, it was a fixed event. It was over. We knew what we had to do. We don't know the long-term effects of this on especially Louisiana, the tourism industry, and the seafood industry. And so we have to take an approach today, and we have to start today knowing it's going to be a long-term battle. I think you mentioned that earlier. Uh, we, we, we can't just end this at any date certain. It may go on for many, many years. And we've had conversations with uh, tourism industry officials and, and seafood officials from Alaska. And after the Valdez incident, they've told us it's taken five to ten years uh, for them to overcome the effects of just that spill. And as I've mentioned to my colleagues and others that will listen in, in the media, um, what our problem is, I guess, Mr. Feinberg, is, is what we don't see out there in the marshes and the Gulf that are the concerns for us for the future. And that's why, um, you know, knowing that you fully well see the long term, uh, it's not like a 9-11, we settle and we're done and we walk away. Uh, and that's where I may not be around, uh, either because the Lord doesn't wish it for me or whatever, but uh, I just hope that maybe that the people will be made whole in some way, shape, or form. Um, I want to thank the chairman for um, uh, having this hearing as we continue to move forward to understand the problems that are faced by the people of the Gulf Coast of this country and hope that whatever we do, 
uh, the resolve will be such that it will be a model for the future. So, Mr. Feinberg, I pledge you and your folks uh, full cooperation of my office uh, as long as I am in office to, to help you with this problem. And again, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, thank you all for allowing me to, to wave on to the committee. <clears throat> you back to balance my time. Uh, that said, uh, the chair wants want to inform all the members, all the witnesses, that you have been very patient. Uh, you have participated uh, and informed this subcommittee far beyond our expectation. Uh, but we, and we certainly are appreciative of your sacrifice of your time uh, that you committed to this process. Uh, we, yes, uh, Mr. Dow, you had a... Mr. Chairman, may I make one statement? Uh, one of the more moving and impressive things that I've seen is in September of 2008, you returned to the House on the floor to personally support the Travel Promotion Act, which is now law. Yes. You appreciate, you understand what promotion can do. Yes. Your heroism being there, but most important, I'm going to ask this committee and Congress if we can move forward and push for a $500 million fund. It is not in Mr. Feinberg's purview. But if we do this, we can limit significantly what is going to be spent in damages and recovery. And you understand that as well as anyone. Thank you, sir. The chair does understand. And the chair is, uh, personally is fully uh, committed to that. However, uh, the committee will take that under consideration and, and give uh, its uh, intense uh, uh, insight or its intense interest uh, in that, and we will engage in a process to determine what our next step should be. Uh, but I want you to know that I do understand. Uh, I know how important it is. And the chair, as, he, uh, as was indicated earlier, really appreciate all the witnesses for your time. I know that Mr. Feinberg uh, does have a 12:30 deadline that he has to meet uh, in terms of uh, leaving. And so with that in mind, uh, the committee now stands adjourned. You can watch this and other hearings on the Gulf of Mexico oil spill by visiting our website. Listen to today's news briefing with retired Admiral Thad Allen. For